The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. It's a pleasure to give this talk. My co-authors are Evan Bentz from the University of Toronto because I'm going to use some of the models that he developed. He was one of the originators of the Life 365 program, but he's developed other models that you probably don't know. And this project was funded through the Silica Fume Association. Tony Kajundik set up the project, and mainly the funding came through the U.S. Federal Highway Administration. And this is a picture of Pear and Inga after he was made an honorary member a couple of years ago. I think that was in Minneapolis, and that was great. I've had the pleasure of visiting Paraninga at their house in Christian Sand and at their previous summer place on the island with Dino the dog. <laughs> and we've had the pleasure of hosting them at our summer place in northern Ontario as well. Not quite the same quality as their place in the island, so Christian Sand, but anyway. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be here and to see Inga and uh, to give this talk. This work was, as I said, was to evaluate performance of existing silica fume concretes at the time. It's a bit dated now. It's a few years out of date, but it still shows 10 and 15 year performance of silica fume concretes in parking decks and bridge decks in the United States and various states. And to look at it with respect to what you would have got if you'd done the Life 365 model, for example, and plugged in that concrete mix and let it run away and predict a time to corrosion. We also then looked at the data that we got from the actual chloride profiles in these structures after 10 or 15 years, and then use that to figure out the residual service life using a modified model to predict, the, to, and to see if Life 365 would be conservative in that respect. So are we safe using Life 365 for evaluation of silica fume concretes in terms of their time to corrosion? And Life 365 model, if you don't know it, is available for free through life365.org. They've got this new version 222 that has just been updated in the last uh, few weeks to correct a few things. And so it's been out there for a while, but in various forms. The structures we looked at, I'll show you the structures first, then I'll start showing the data, various data, in the way we collected it. We looked at a number of bridge decks, one in Ohio, full depth silica fume concrete that was 15 years old at the time. The references of the dates, there are papers that were written about those structures, the use of the silica fume concrete. There was the first New York silica fume deck overlay they tried. It was 15 years old, one built to their New York's high-performance spec that was seven years old. It was written up by Don Streeter of New York DOT. There was a, another high-performance deck in New York and a conventional deck or approach pavement for one of the same structures. So we had a comparison between a Portland cement concrete and a silica fume concrete of the same time and using the same aggregates, same supplier of concrete. So we thought we'd have a good comparison for looking at the advantages of silica fume. And so these are the bridge deck locations. Four were in New York, one in Ohio. That uh, shows you the year place. They were sampled in 2001, I believe. Maybe some of them in 2002. You can see the water cementitious materials ratio. Some of them used silica fume alone. Some of them used fly ash plus silica fume in ternary blends. And one of them, as I say, was an overlay. Okay, so that's the one in Ohio, showing pictures that were taken in 2008. That's the bridge structure. That just shows the deck condition in 2008 that we built in 1987. Again, it looks pretty good shape. Another photo of the surface. You can still see the tining on the surface. This is the overlay that was done in New York, the first silica fume overlay they did in, that was 20 years old at the time these pictures were taken. Now, we couldn't get down to look at the deck because it's on the throughway. Tony took these pictures from the side and from underneath to show the condition. But they didn't remove the base layer of concrete. There was an overlay, and they didn't get rid of all the chlorides in the base layer of concrete. So there's continued deterioration of the concrete, the substrate below the overlay in that structure, which you can see from below. You can see some exposed rebar in these areas here. You can see holes where the cores came through. So they didn't replace the full deck. This was an overlay on the original deck. 
This is one of the other where they did do a full depth replacement. And there's the, other than the joint problem on the approach, the deck itself on the bridge is in good shape. And again, another picture of the, showing the tining on the deck that we built in 94, so these were 14 years old at the time of the picture taken. Now the approaches on this deck, on the one approach was the Portland cement control mix, whereas the deck itself was done with the silica fume design. And again, you can see some of this, there seems to be a crack down the middle there in this particular deck, and maybe another one there, and longitudinal cracks in this approach with the Portland cement con control. This is the approach slab. Again, showing that approach. And as you can see, a core location where the core was taken and patched from the uh, deck. So, going on to the parking decks before I continue with the results of the bridge decks. There were parking decks taken in Utah, two in different locations in Ohio, one in Wisconsin at the airport in Milwaukee. So you can see that when we go to the next ACI meeting, when you get out and cruise the parking garage when, after you land and uh, see the wonders of silica fume concrete in the garage. It was built in 1989 using a 0.35 water cementitious materials ratio concrete with silica fume and fast sea fly ash. And this Utah, which is the Salt Lake garage, I think it was built around the time of the Salt Lake Olympics or prior to that, used flash and silica fume, whereas these two garages in Ohio were done with straight silica fume. That just shows the construction during the Milwaukee Airport garage, pictures that Tony provided, showing again the floating and the curing compound that was placed. You can see that how close the curing compound is behind the final tining there. And that's what it looked like in 2007 on the top deck, the condition of the deck, and there's the, some of the driving aisles inside. The, it's a multi-level garage. This garage was cored in 2001, and full depth cores were recovered, including some rebar cuts, as you can see, in that deck. This is the sort of testing we did on the cores that we received from the Silica Fume Association. We took the top 50 millimeters or two inches and did a surface chloride. We wanted to see how far the chlorides had gotten in over the time period. We took a slice as a backup for some possible other testing. And we did the rapid chloride 1202 test, rapid chloride permeability on one core. And we did some bulk chloride diffusion testing, put it ASTM 1556 on the other one, which we could then use in the modeling process. So we could use this to see what the quality of the concrete was achieved in situ. And then we could use these to see what the penetration was. And again, we could relate this and the rapid chloride. We also checked the depth of carbonation on the cores, which in all cases was zero, undetectable carbonation in all these concretes after that time period. The rapid chloride permeability test, I'm sure most people are well aware of it. It's basically a clunky conductivity test or inverse of resistivity test that takes about five hours and 55 minutes too long and involves some complicated placing of solutions when you could just use two steel electrodes and a conductive gel. And so there are resistivity tests that can replace this and give you basically the same information in a couple of minutes. But anyway, this has become a standard test. It's been in use since 1983 and almost every DOT has got one, and most testing labs have it, so it continues to be used in specifications. But I think we'll see changes over the next five or 10 years as we change that out to resistivity type testing. So we measured the chloride permeability in some of these things, either the bridge decks, and I think the first talk this morning, Brian Green says you should check that the information you got is correct, and we have a few of those situations here. This overlay, we've got a huge Coulomb value, like in the order of 2300, something you'd expect from a Portland cement concrete. You can see the silica fume concretes were down 300, 700, 400. And this is the Portland cement control at about 4,000 here. Numbers that make sense. And then this one came up, 2300, and there's something odd here. We went back and talked to the New York DOT and found out they did three experiments on that deck. Not just silica fume overlay, they tried a latex overlay and a low slump mix. And so we didn't necessarily get every core from the silica fume overlay. This is, of course, what you find out after you do the testing. So that's why that one seems a, like an oddball in the bunch. The parking garage Coulomb values, you see values there. Again, about 900. That's an average value of the two cores we tested. Here we got two really low numbers and, again, a really high number. And what we found out is, again, they didn't contain silica fume. We did some evaluation, a microscopic evaluation, found out, well, there wasn't any silica fume there. So if we left that out of the average, the numbers were less than 1,000. Same with Salt Lake City, we got two low values, one high value. Again, it turns out they didn't use silica fume at some locations near the elevator area where the core was extracted. So again, low numbers if you exclude that because again, after the fact, we found out things aren't as they seem. We did the ASTM 1556 
bulk diffusion test, which we stole from the, the Scandinavians, NERD test method, because it seemed like a good method and it was in wide use in a number of countries. And you need to do the same test. If you're going to measure chloride bulk diffusion, everybody has to use the same test method or you'll get a different number. If you vary the salt concentration, the time of exposure, temperature, you'll get a different answer. So you have to do things the same way to get comparative results. So we thought, well, they'd done a lot of work to sort of optimize this. We stuck with it when we developed this test method. And you basically seal up the specimen, expose one side to salt ingress in a salt solution, a saturated sample, and then you profile grind it, get a chloride profile, and you backfit using an error function solution to fix second law to get a diffusion coefficient and a surface concentration from that. And that's the sort of data you need to use in a service-like model. So anyway, this is the results of that chloride diffusion. We did two tests on each structure. So I've shown the average value in the right-hand column in 10 to the minus 12 meters squared per second units for your convenience. But that's the units you typically get. So 10 to the minus 12 is a typical range of concretes. If you're in the range of under 5 times 10 to the minus 12, you're in really low range. So what you can see here is the, the silica fume mixes are in the 3, 4, 7, 2 range. The Portland cement is an order of magnitude higher. You can see that the chloride diffusion rate of that Portland cement concrete is about an order of magnitude higher than the other concretes with silica fume. So that has a huge impact on the service life if you feed that into a model. Again, we did this on the garage decks. The diffusion coefficients are in the order. Typically, there's an oddball here, but mostly you're in the 5, 3, 4, 5, 10, 110. And again, here's the Portland cement mix from the airport garage in Salt Lake that corresponded to the same core that had the high Coulomb values. We also got crazy high, like Portland cement style, diffusion values, an order of magnitude higher than the silica fume decks. And then we measured the outer 50 millimeters of concrete that had been directly exposed to the chlorides. We did the surface chloride profiling on the concrete. So this shows chloride concentration with depth. This goes down to 50 millimeters or two inches here. So we profile grind every millimeter or two down the surface. And again, very consistent results. These are four cores out of the same bridge deck. So the results are very consistent in terms of chloride profile in these different locations of the cores after six years. So this, was, this one was only six years old at the time of testing. And so if you look at here, the chloride penetration to what would be a critical chloride depth for depassivating steel is penetrated in the 25 to 30 millimeter range at that point with the silica fume concretes. And that just shows the profile grinding, and that's how we did the titration using an auto titrator. Now, this is the same structure with the Portland cement control. Again, four different core profiles at different locations with the Portland cement approach slabs. And those same chlorides, if we look at the same sort of critical chloride threshold that will initiate corrosion, the chlorides had penetrated 60 to 70 millimeters in that same six years as opposed to 25 or 30. So it's quite a significant change in the chloride penetration the front of that profile. You see a little more variability here in the concrete profiles, you know, which could be due to the difference in salting in different locations across that slab. So then we say, well, let's fit some diffusion coefficients to those surface profiles. But if you're going to do that, you need to know the time frame that they were exposed. We know how old the structures were, but you don't know how many times they're exposed to salt. You don't salt the roads 12 months of the year. So we looked at weather data, and we looked at the total time since the structure was built, as a measure, which would be grossly conservative. And we looked at just if you only assume the winter months where they're applying salt. We basically took the weather records, and any time the temperature started to fall below freezing, we assumed they probably started salting the roads. And in the spring, when it stopped freezing, we figured they probably stopped. So we took that time frame for each of the locations where we had weather data and used that to fit a, a time frame, number of months per year times the number of years to come up with the time frame here. Um, and we came up with a bunch of numbers, which you probably can't see at the back of the room. But you get two different numbers, of course, based on the different time frames. You get a larger number if you only account the shorter time frame, which is the winter months of exposure, versus the total age of the structure. Now, you could argue that even in the summer, the chlorides that are in there are going to still be moving forward if they're wet. The truth is probably somewhere in between the two, or at least the boundary conditions of those values. But we're looking at the numbers here based on those profiles in the one over the Ohio deck in the order of 10 to the minus 13 values of these the same numbers. So we're looking at numbers that are 10 times lower than the, the bulk diffusion values even for actual penetration. And these numbers are about in the same range for this deck depending on the time frame. If you use the winter time exposure in this overlay, you'd be looking at about the same sort of numbers as we got from the bulk diffusion. 
And again, just some more numbers you can't see. I'm going to analyze this data so you don't need to actually see this. Again, we did this for the parking decks. In some cases with ZEX, we did four or five, even six diffusion coefficients for these things. And we can see that we could look at the ranges of that values. Again, we're getting numbers in the 10 to the minus 13 meters per second for the decks and even lower numbers for some of the other ones. Again, here's just two more garages where we've got those data points. And again, different numbers depending on the time frame you make the assumption for in those structures. So one of the first things we said, well, do the Coulomb test, the 1202 data, relate to the diffusion test? So we did the Coulomb data on the concrete at the age we tested it. These are the bulk diffusion values at the age we tested it. Is there a relationship? And we get this sort of best fit through a lot of scatter in the data. But that's similar to what you get if you do that on brand new concretes and you evaluate those same numbers. You get a relationship, but there is a lot of scatter in that relationship due to both test methods. Both test methods have a high coefficient of variation. It's not that the Coulomb test is bad, it's that both tests have a lot of variability. So you do get noise in the data. This is where we said, well, how much life is left in these structures before we start to get, if we assume a depth of steel, because we didn't have the steel depths in all these structures, if you assume just a constant depth, say 50 millimeters or two inches, how long would it take between now, at the condition now, until the chlorides are going to get to the steel and start corrosion in the structure? So we used the Conflux software, which is basically the Life 365 software with a couple other toys added to it. It's the same engine that drives Life 365, but allows you to put in initial chloride profiles that have gotten in over time, and we can start from that profile and move forward basically using other assumptions that are the same. And we made an assumption that the threshold to cause corrosion was 0.05% by massive concrete to depassivate the steel, and Life 365 assumes once you depassivate the steel, you've got six years before you can have corrosion and damage that occurs because the data collected, I think Richard Wire's data showed for a lot of bridge decks, this was pretty reasonable for the U.S. environment, that six years is about what happens once you depassivate the steel until you've got stuff that needs to be repaired. So that's the data. There's the Life 365 program. There's the Conflex program. They look kind of the same on the cover page. This is data for the bridge decks. What we did is we looked at the estimated residual surface life, and that added six years to it for the time to repair after it's initiated corrosion. And for the silica fume concretes, we had residual surface life uh, for the full depths, 40 years, 71 years, 63 years from the time that we did the coring in 2001. Now, for the overlay, it was a lower life, about 20 years, but again, they didn't replace the whole concrete, just the overlay, and there was corrosion going on underneath. For the Portland cement control, the remaining service life, if there was reinforcement in that approach, would be zero. The chlorides had penetrated to our assumed depth of steel in a critical concentration, so it would have been corroding now, or at least at the time we did the corn. Again, we did this there, and we said, well, what if we used Life 365 and said, okay, well, here's our input. We had the mixed designs. We did it just like if you didn't know anything about the history. We'd take the mixed designs, put them into Life 365, and predict when you would get to that same concentration at two inches or 50 millimeters depth cover. And we got different numbers, which were higher. And I plotted it here in sort of, what's the error in the late 365 prediction if you didn't have any field data? And in three out of the four cases there, Life 365 is conservative in the 10-year range. 10-year range up, one is 32 years conservative. The one that's unconservative is that overlay. Again, because it seemed to be not performing as well at that time. For the garages, we did the same thing. From the service life, from our chloride profiles, we predicted this time residual service life from 50 years up to 150 years, essentially, of residual service life based on how far the chlorides had got in at the time of coring. And when we did the Life 365 predictions, they were conservative by even more than that <coughs> prediction. So Life 365 was even more conservative than our actual data point profiling would predict and then driving that forward. And I think the reason for that is Life 365 assumes a higher buildup rate. They assume that the chlorides at the surface will build up over a six-year period and linearly over a six-year period, which makes sense for bridge decks where you're going to be salting every winter you'll eventually build up to a concentration at the surface which is going to drive the diffusion. But in parking decks, they don't salt parking decks, but cars drop salt water as the ice melts as they come into parking decks and they park their cars. The salt ends up as a byproduct on the pavements, but you're not actively salting those decks. So it's not surprising really that we see these really conservative values on the decks from that point of view. 
The results from the parking decks show that the data, the models are very over conservative, at least with the data set that we have here. And we see lives that would be longer than prediction by over 100 years. And that is because of this buildup, which is what I'm saying here. The real chloride buildup is going to be much slower in a parking deck where it's covered and there's no deliberately applied salt. The results from the study conclude that the carbonation is zero, so we didn't see any effect of carbonation in these applications where they're exposed to the weather or even in the garages. The silica fume and the silica fume ternary concretes were low, well under 1,000, but they were high for the Portland cement concretes, which makes sense. They had a reasonable fit of the coulombs to the diffusion values within the noise of the data. The diffusion values from the surface penetration of the actual structures were lower than was determined by the bulk diffusion test on the concrete below the chloride penetration. And the chloride diffusion predicted by Life 365 matched those for the bridge decks. That should be qualified as the bridge deck cores fairly well. They were within, you know, a decade or so, which given the uncertainties in the modeling process is pretty good prediction. So the residual service life of these silica fume bridge decks range from 30 to 71 years and which was about 10 years on average of all those structures longer than the predicted by Life 365. So if you took the Life 365, you'd be on the conservative side. The predictions for the parking decks were far too conservative because I think of this slower chloride buildup. But the net result is the silica fume is doing good things for extending the time to corrosion of both bridge decks and parking decks. So that's the takeaway. And thanks again for Pear's sort of starting of this thing. He's interested in chloride and ternary mixes and silica fume and pushing this along. So we are using these types of concretes in these structures that are aggressive exposures. So thanks.